This Twin Peaks Investing Podcast is brought to you in association with SharePad from ShareScope, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. Visit sharescope.co.uk and discover the advantage. Hello and welcome to the Twin Peaks Investing Podcast. My name is Peter Higgins and you can find me at Conquest 3 and I'm here with my good friend Peter at Wheelie Dealer on Twitter. This is podcast number 69, it's the 23rd of February 2022 and the noise we're hearing across the markets is one of talk of Russia, Ukraine. Obviously we've still got interest rates and inflation being talked about, but everything's being moved and the volatility of the markets has increased somewhat <sighs> significantly because of all of the actions or inactions and talk and rhetoric and movement of tanks across and through certain boundaries around the Ukraine. So we're going to try our best not to talk too much about that and focus on the investing, but I think we need to, to make sure that everyone's aware who isn't already because of the, of the situation on the BBC and all the other channels that this is what's going on. This is why you're seeing markets up 1% in the morning and then flat or down 1% in the afternoon and vice versa. This is why you're seeing 400 points plus, 200 points plus on the US exchanges and then minus 200 or minus 300 by the time it's closing. So that's what's going on, folks. Yeah. Joe, it's interesting. Got- I think, I think it's, it's, Obviously, Ukraine is causing the immediate problems at the moment, if you like. But we've sort of had this back. I mean, we're now, you know, the end of March. We've basically had a really, really poor start to the year. And it's it's a very end, end of Feb, please. end of Feb, uh, end of Feb. Sorry. Yeah. And it's a very weak market already. And, and into this weak market, we then get thrown this really serious situation which is obviously pushing oil and gas prices through the roof and increasing costs for businesses and all the rest of it um, and that's against you know the backdrop of rising interest rates and whatever and and of course it's that it's that thing that once the market stops worrying about ukraine fingers crossed that doesn't take too long to sort of calm down um you know there's going to be something else they're going to worry about so i just think we're in that we're in that sort of market where There is no good news around at the moment. It's just very hard to find something to make you want to buy. It's it's interesting. I mean, the the thing is, and and people need to put this into context, there's lots of history around the issues uh, around um, Russia as a bloc and um, the Ukraine and the fact that, you know, it's a former state of, of Russia. And obviously, certain bodies want it back. Um, so this is something which is going to be on and being talked about, and could lead to significant efforts being made to actually get that sovereign state back. Um, so we need to watch out. Really, I think the important thing to think about is this, right? Uh, and some people have said it in different ways, in the sense of. These things have been underlying for, for for years and years and years, and they're not going to be dealt with um, overnight. It's one of those things whereby we need to make sure we consider the implications for the people that are in the Ukraine. I know we're, we like to focus on the on the investing side of it, and we need to, um, and we probably should focus on it on the, in this podcast. But unfortunately, if shots get fired, if cannons roll here, there, and everywhere. People will, you know, will lose their lives, and we need to 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 think about that and put and put that into context, and also think about the the important issue of, you know, we sometimes have to step up and and say what we feel about the situation because, you know, if we don't speak up, is that case of oh, it does it doesn't matter it matters to me because, well, actually, anything that leads to somebody losing their lives should matter to all of us because if we don't speak up at some point. At some point, we're going to look round, and there's going to be only us left to speak up. And who's going to speak up for you or me? 
when there's no one left to speak up because no one else has woke up in the past, if that makes sense. No, no, it totally makes sense. sense. There's, there's, there's a really um, sort of bigger issue here. And it's around, you know, for the last, I don't know, I, I, I've no, no idea how long, 20, 30 years, whatever it is. I suppose really you could say since the breakup of the USSR, yeah, we've been in this sort of environment, this, this macro environment where um, there's been democracies and democracy has seen to be the way forward. And we seem to be coming up to this situation where we have, you know, countries like China, countries like Russia, countries like Hungary are getting that way. Poland's getting that way. Um, you know, there's various places, North Korea, obviously, Iran, blah, blah, blah. Loads of countries are getting dictatorships and they are starting to threaten the, the, the sort of What's that word? Hegemony, I think it's called, isn't it? The, the, sort of, the sort of power and the force of democracy is coming onto a serious challenge. Does that mean, from an investing perspective, that valuations need to be lower to, affect, to, to reflect that new risk? I mean, I think, I don't mean it's something we should, should be, you know, losing loads of sleep over at this second, but it's just another thing in the background that we need to consider when investing. Absolutely. And if you're going to stick on, if you're going to stick on the investing sort of um, line, uh, then you need to th consider the other aspects of why Ukraine. You go away from the polit political side of it and have a look at the resources that are in the re Ukraine. And, and, I'll, and I'll grab some stats because I wanted to speak about this a little bit regarding why why Ukraine. Forget about the the, the politics of it and the the his history of, of of Russia and Ukraine. These are some of the resources that um, Ukraine are involved in. Right, so they're first in Europe for proven recoverable res reserves of u uranium oil, uranium ores. So remember that conversation about where things are going regarding the use of uranium at the minute. Yeah. Second yeah. place in Europe and 10th place in the world in terms of titanium ore reserves. Second place in the world in terms of explored resources for magnesium ores. So that's 2.3 billion or 3 billion tonnes or 12% of the world reserves. Second largest iron ore reserves in the world. Yeah, 30 billion tons. Second place in Europe in terms of mercury ore reserves. Third place in Europe with regards to shale gas reserves, 23 trillion cubic meters. Fourth in the world regarding total natural resources. Seven in the world of cold resources. I could I could go on here. Oh, yeah. um, but yeah, first yeah. in Europe in terms of arable land area land mass. First in the first place in the world in exports of sunflower and sunflower oil. Yeah, corn. Potatoes, largest ripe, fifth largest rye producer in the world. There's lots going on here, guys, ladies, gents. You know what I mean? You think if if supply of energy is affected, we all see that instantly because you know our gas bills yeah. go up. We go. To, I, was, I was hearing today that at the petrol station is the highest price ever for unleaded petrol. So like just under one pound fifty a litre. You know, and th these are just scary numbers and. So, so you've got those kind of issues. But then you look at you were talking there about, um, you know, oil, um, sort of vegetable oil and stuff like that. Ukraine is a massive producer of agricultural stuff. And you just think, you know, it, if, if it becomes if it becomes a situation where it just cannot produce as much because of the chaos and stuff that, that could be in the country, whatever. You know, again, it's going to cause inflation and drive up prices for consumers all around Europe, you know, well, everywhere, basically, the prices of commodities go up. So it's just putting more and more cost of living pressure on adding to this inflation problem. And, and, and you know, so, so yeah, it's a really serious issue in more ways than the, the obvious one of a sovereign country being threatened by an invader, you know. Absolutely. I mean, I want to put this into context as well regarding the volatility of the markets and give you give you all some sort of numbers. I'm going to go back to yesterday's um, data and then bring you up to, to today's data. So we had quite a, a, a very volatile day yesterday. yesterday. Um, we had the, the, the intraday low on the FTSE um, was 7,365. And that's the first time in a while we've dipped below 7,400. Um, we had a high of 7,531 on the FTSE and we closed at 4, 7,494. The FTSE 250 um, closed at 20,993. 
and that was down almost half a percent at a high of 21,136 and a low of 20,793, sorry, 7,000 and 20,709, should I say, sorry. Um, for the FTSE AIM All Share, it was hovering at 1,031. That was down nearly 1% yesterday. Um, had a low of 1,026 and a high of 1,040 and finished at 131, as I said. And today has been another volatile day, but it didn't dip below um, 7,400 again uh, today. The markets actually were up this morning, as I said earlier. The market is this volatile. And then they gave up most of their gains in the, um, in the afternoon. Um, so today, the FTSE 100, um, the low was four, I'll keep doing this, 7,490. And the high was 7,549. And it closed just below um, 7,500 at 7,498. The FTSE 250 was 20,841, down 0.72%. The low was 20,838, and the high was 21,227. And the FTSE AIM finished at 10, 1,031 again, uh, barely moved. It was flat, essentially. Um, high of 1,039, a low of 1,030. So that's what we had. And we had some 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 significant movers um, on the markets again today that was moving up and down three or four or five percent. Um, so lots of people's portfolios have been impacted by this volatility, Pete. It's, 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 I mean, it's been an absolutely it's been absolutely disgraceful start to 2022. It's been been most unpleasant. Um, I mean, again, the, the thing that stands out um, as of today, as we said, 23rd of February, FTSE 100 is still the best looking index. And using the, the favorite, one of the favorite indicators that I use, which is the 13 stroke 21 day EMA, exponential moving averages, is the only one amongst all of the major indexes that is still bullish. And it's, it's been testing that bullishness. We're very near a bear cross. If we get a bear cross, then it will fall into line with all the other indexes. But as it stands, it's still just about hanging on to being bullish. So I don't want to turn negative on the FTSE 100 until we get that sort of confirmation. Um, but when you look at all the other indexes, and I, I found that the price action today was really disappointing. Um, yesterday, Monday, we were in a, uh, sorry, Tuesday, we were in a situation where we'd had a big drop on most of the indexes. We'd had a big drop. Then we had a, what you call a doji candle or a hammer candle. Yeah. Which is where the, where the price sort of opens, moves up high, drops down low, closes back where it was. Or, you know, you get this, this, there's a lot of volatility. You get a long tail doji. There's an opportunity there for bulls to take and drive it back up again. And they've completely flunked it. They took it in the morning and I thought, oh, this is a interesting sign because it looks like the bulls are going to have a go. They started off, you know, with the markets rising. I think they were up nearly 1% earlier in the morning and it just drifted back all through the day. And it was interesting when the US opened, I'd, I'd pop around a weldy. I, I'd had enough, you know what I mean? I was out of here. <laughs> I got around a weldy and I came back sort of expecting the US markets to be up, you know, at least having a, a go by the bulls to try and do something. And I was quite surprised to see it was red when I when I, you know, when I looked at about three o'clock. Um, and the reason I'm particularly interested is that I've got 40 percent of my long portfolio hedged. So I'm sure on the S&P 500, obviously a US index. So really, I don't mind too much if it falls. Oh, and, and I'm looking at it now. And this is um, this is nearly seven o'clock at night. Yeah. Seven p.m. And the U.S. markets are, are pretty looking pretty ropey, really. Um, so, you know, I just think I just think we're in this major, major downtrend on all the indexes, apart from the FTSE 100. And at the moment, there's no sign that's changing. And I actually think. The indexes could fall quite away from here, which is part of the reason I'm 40% hedged. I wanted to really 
you know, it, it in effect, by being 40% hedge, it's as if I've sold 40% of my portfolio and moved to cash. It has a similar effect. But the beauty of doing it the way I do it, yeah, it sounds complicated, but the beauty is it's quick, it's cheap. You know, I don't have to think about, am I going to sell this? I'm going to sell this, going to sell this. I don't have to think later, what am I going to buy? It's just like an on-off switch. I'm either hedged or I'm not hedged. At the moment, I'm heavily hedged. Yeah, I, I understand what you're doing with the, with the hedging, Pete. Obviously, we don't have the same strategy. I tend, and I've said this before, we've had the discussion before, uh, um, when we were talking back March 2020, and I've subsequently been doing the similar sort of situation back back then, um, started doing it in November of last year, again, trimming the stocks that I've not got conviction in, or I think, you know what, if things go pear-shaped, I am... Um, I want to have as much cash as I what, possibly can. What, what was it that made you want to move to cash back in November? I've just been seeing the. I've just seen the markets not quite push, punching through all the different stuff. Pete, we had the inflation thing already dragging us. There was conversations being had about interest rates potentially rising in 2022. Uh, we didn't have the talk about um, gas and electric prices going through the roof then, and that's come up. We've now got the there's other stuff now with Ukraine, Russia potentially kicking off. So yeah. I've been trimming and trimming and trimming and, and, I've, and I've obviously bought a couple of stocks as well um, at the same time, which I think is value because I'm looking two or three years away from 2022 regarding some things that I've purchased. But that, my, my cautionary thing has, has been there for a little while. And yeah. I think we're going to have days where we get the rhetoric and it's like, oh, it's all over and blah, 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 blah. And um, all's right with the world. And we'll see the market, FTSE or whatever it is, ping 2%, right? But the next day or the or two week, two days later or a week later, we're going to hear tanks are rolling on blah, blah, blah. So we could be here for a day. We could be here for a week. We could be here for, for months regarding this um, situation. And the markets will yeah. be volatile. One of the reasons I love the 13-stroke 21-day EMA is that it's quite a slow signal, so it doesn't sort of trigger every other day. You know, it, it, it's like to go from where we are now in a bearish situation, it would probably need, say, five or six positive days to get the trend to change and to make it turn bullish. What that means is you get quite a certainty that once it does change signal from bearish to go in bullish, that is a very good sign that actually the bears are now losing strength and the bulls are coming back. So I love it from that point of view. It's like you can sort of close your mind to all the stuff that's going on, all the Ukraine, all the interest rates, all the, the consumer prices, the politics. You can just shut your mind to it all. Just focus on that chart indicator along with some other chart indicators and it gives you a very good steer on what to do. Um, yeah, I was intrigued. Yeah. Back in November, when you were saying about selling, how much did valuations come into your thinking? Because when we look back now, I mean, we were all saying, you know, that the NASDAQ was getting pretty daft on the valuations. They were getting so stretched. Did that come into your thinking much? Not a lot, because I... I what I tend to do is I tend to look at my own stocks, Pete. I look at my own stocks and how, how they've done versus what I'm seeing in the market and or what I'm hearing in the market. And what the what I'm, some people will class it just as noise. Yeah. yeah? But the, the noise that people want to hear and the noise that's actually out there are two different things. Um, we're very selective on the noise we want to hear. And it's the reason why I've, I still hold some stocks and, which are down 30, 40 percent. Right. We can be very selective and we're biased ordinarily. Yeah, so yeah. I'm looking at my portfolio and I'm hearing this noise and, and that noise. And I'm thinking, OK, you know what? Let me just take some off the table. For, and I said this to, to everybody on the last podcast. Don't wait for the markets to knock that 10 percent or 5 percent or 20 percent or 30 percent to force you to sell. Take it off the table if you're happy enough to take it off the table. I've got stocks which I've got a certain level of conviction on and they've just gone whoop, 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 and carried on going down. Yeah. That's Another me being a clown. Is. Right. OK, that's fine. But the difference is, is that the, the situations where I've been a clown in a certain stock, I've got maybe 2% or 25 or maybe 3% at best in that position. I haven't got 15%, 25% on, 
or 100% in that stock. Some people are holding one, two, three, four, or five stocks in binary plays. And when they move 30, 40, 50% for the benefit of them, it's happy days. Everyone's dancing and, you know, dancing in the sunshine. But when it goes wrong, and just one of those stocks that's got 30 or 40% in goes wrong and it's down 30, 40, 50 I mean, the portfolio is absolutely smashed. You and they need that. the rest of the portfolio to carry them by going up 100%. So yeah. I'm trying to, this goes back to the conversation I was having um, with Mary McDougall from the Investors Chronicle. And she was saying about benchmarking, Pete. So she wrote this article about benchmarking. And I said, well, you know what? I don't actually use the FTSE or, or the S&P 500 or the FTSE All Share or the, the tech indicators or the NASDAQ or whatever. I set out my stall each year and I give myself a very low low bar or an average bar, whichever where people are. And I say, I need to just achieve 10% a year. Yeah, that's all I'm looking to achieve. Yeah, and over the past 10 years, I've smashed that, which is fine and fair enough. But I'm, I'm making sure I take the risk where I take the risk in a smaller portion of my portfolio. Yeah, and that's the most important bit. I'm not competing against anybody else's metrics, not competing against the NASDAQ, not competing against John, Paul, Alan, Fred, Susan, whoever it is. Yeah. I'm just competing against me. And that's yeah, you're, it. You're, you're, just, you're just, you know, um, trying to get better. You're learning. You're doing everything you can, you know, whatever. And, but you, you've got like a sensible return that you want to achieve every year. But without taking ridiculous levels of risk, and you accept there will be years when you might even lose money. It's going to happen sooner or later. But there'll be years where you do really well. And, you know, it's I, I've said this before that I always say there's like five possible outcomes on a year. There's a year where you're pretty much flat or there or thereabouts. There's a year where you lose 10 percent. There's a year when you, you lose more than 10 percent. And equally on the other side, there's years where you gain 10% and years where you gain more than 10%. And what you want to try and do is have as few of these really horrible ones as possible and try to minimize the down 10% ones. And the more of the other ones you get, the better your over results are going to be over time. But it, it's about doing it in a way where you can sleep at night, the risk is controlled. I think one of the things that 2022 has taught everybody so heavily is the importance of diversification. I mean, I am so pleased that I've got my income portfolio, which just holds big, boring income stocks like Shell, HSBC, Vodafone, Glaxo, AstraZeneca, just really boring, big stuff generally that pays dividends. And then in my other portfolio, I have, I have slightly more exciting stuff. But the point is that that diversity has really helped me during this situation, because even though I don't have a massive proportion of my money in the income portfolio, the fact that that's actually holding up pretty well makes me feel a damn sight better about the fact that my normal portfolio is being, you know, suffering quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, I meant to say earlier, Pete, when you mentioned the FTSE is holding up really, really well. We had that really good news from AstraZeneca early on the week, and that yeah. that's actually popping up the markets at the moment because it's back above above um, ninety pounds, or it was before the close of the market. I didn't see what that, it was today. Think that, oil, that was up. Was it four four percent the other the other week? Um, the other yeah, day? yeah. The, I mean, week. The, the oil price and the resources and all that that's helping it as well, and the higher mm. interest rates is helping on the banks. I mean, you know, yeah. yeah. I've held, we had this discussion on this podcast. We talked about whether I should sell Stan or HSBC. And, and I had a long sort of think about it and whatever. And in the end, I did basically nothing. It's turned out <laughs> doing, nothing, doing nothing was the best possible thing I could have done. Uh, you know, if in doubt, do nothing. And, and both of them have rallied really well, especially HSBC. It's been H HSBA. It is, it is, it's been incredible. And, and I'm so pleased that I just, didn't panic. I'd stay calm and, and it'll be what it will be is often the, the best approach with these things. Right. Pete, I want to talk about this tweet here from somebody on Twitter. Yeah. Um, I pronounce it as, uh, as Haim High. It's at A1M High, Aim High. And yeah. he wrote a, a brilliant That's tweet. Good, um, I know him. Yeah. yeah. I know him. Good luck. Good luck. I'll read the tweet as it, as, as it was written. 
Uh, just a pet annoy annoyance I need to get off my chest. Trade your own portfolio equity curve. That is your own index reality, not the FTSE 100 or the S&P 500 or any other index for that matter. If many of your own stocks are down four minus 4% and your portfolio is down minus 2%, that is your reality. The fact that the FTSE 100 is up plus 0.13% is, is someone else's business, not yours. It should have zero bearing on your decision making unless you own a FTSE 100 index tracker. Often the market makers make index returns look better than the reality for investors because they raise prices in beaten down indexes that nobody owns. Yeah, at the end of the day, it is your own equity balance that you can spend, not that of the FTSE 100. I just thought that was a really good, good point he was yeah. making there or she was making there. Because I think the the importance sometimes we 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 miss is that oh the FTSE is up my portfolio is down something's wrong with my portfolio oh right. you know Wheelie's portfolio is up this week and mine isn't therefore there's something wrong with my my stocks and that creates churn and competition and all the rest of it and it goes back to what I'm saying about you should just be benchmarking and competing against whatever it is that your return what you want your returns to be for this year and the realities of what you did in 2020 or what you did in 2021 may not be realistic for 2022 because of the headwinds that we've currently got. So you have to have a realistic sort of goal. You know, this year it might be a case of, you know, given the way that the markets have started, some people are down 10, 15, 20% already, given some of the polls we've seen so far this year. So they some people that just well. are playing that markets improve <laughs> and they end up flat this year rather than, than up, you know? No, it's, a, it's an interesting one. I mean, I think, I think there are as with everything right with everything in investing and with trading there's nuance right so i think i think it's absolutely right what a1 m high and what you're saying about benchmarking and that but i think there is a wider point that the indexes the major indexes especially if you look at a load of them give you a very good flavor of the tone of the market and when you've got a market like it is now which is extremely weak which I personally think can probably go a hell of a lot lower. And I'm talking, you know, I think, you know, sort of brace yourselves, listeners. I'm talking possibly 10, 15 percent from here. Some of it could fall. You know, we need to we need to be aware that that is a possibility to go buying stocks in an aggressive way. Now, unless you are a trader, if you're a trader and you trade in and out every day, fine, you can buy stocks now. You can buy any old junk if you're a trader in and out. It's a different game, right? If you're a long-term investor, buying stocks heavily now, is it might be a really foolish thing to do. I'm not buying stocks heavily now. I'm 40% short. I've been selling 40% I've been selling 40 of my portfolio effectively. That's effectively what I've done. So, you know, I'm massively short. There is no way I would be buying anything now. The only thing I would even remotely think about buying would be oil stocks or resources stocks. I wouldn't touch nothing else. That's controversial. Well, that's the, well, that's the beauty of the markets, Pete. I, I've been seeing opportunities and stuff that I want to buy, and I've been buying them. You know, that's not my advice to anybody else to go and buy anything because I've got a different risk tolerance. It's about risk resilience here. You know, I've got a proportion of my portfolio that's sitting in cash, and I've got a proportion of my, my availability that's sitting in dividend-generating dividend stocks. And I've got the availability to do what I want. There are people at the moment that are saying, you know, last week, the week before last, the month before last, you know, November, December, that 100% invested. Now, the markets have rolled over, and we've been here before, you know. And if you're saying potentially the markets could go down 5 10 15% more, and that happens, then the only way that they can actually get out of that particular situation oh. is by the markets retrieving and, and, and retracing and going back up again. So I'm having the cash available to see opportunities to buy what I want to buy again, mm. you know. And if I see, yeah. see if one of my stocks that I currently hold is down 10, 15% in the next couple of weeks or months, I could, I've got the availability of cash to actually buy some more if I wish to. That's, you know, and that's this is the, cash is an asset. Cash is a class. Cash is a, cash is a position, folks. <laughs> you know, when the markets are in, the, in bullish territory and they're all climbing, whoosh, 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 the last thing you want to be is sitting there in, in cash going, oh, I've missed the boat, I've missed the boat, I've missed the boat. You want to be fully invested, but when the market's wobbly and you're not quite sure where it's going, 
that's the time or prior to that time to have a bit of cash to be flexible with. You know, right now, I don't know where the market's going to go. This is a quick hello to you, our valued Twin Peaks Investing Podcast listener. Whatever channel you're listening to, please make sure to subscribe and you'll always be the first to get the new episodes. Thank you for your continued support. No, I think, I think, I mean, it's really, really important point you make there is, is that, you know, if you've got cash and if you think, yes, a particular stock I'm after looks an interest in buy now, you know, there is some sense in doing that. But the point is, don't put, if you've got, let's say you've got, I don't know, let's say you've got £10,000 put aside and you want to buy GlaxoSmithKline, right? It's just a random stock, right? Um, actually, that's probably a really bad example because that's probably one of the few that's not going to fall, but or not going to fall much. Any old stock, right? Stock XYZ, you think you're going to buy stock XYZ, you know, maybe just buy three grand of it. So you've still got seven grand waiting back. And then if the market falls more, which it could well do, you can then put another three grand and just buy it in nibbles. I think this idea that you just put the whole 10 grand in and then it falls 15 percent. And you're like, what a wally I am. And it really it psychologically it's horrible. It, it knocks your confidence. It makes you feel a fool. And the point is, you were impatient. You could have waited. That's the reality of it. And what you could have been doing was learning a bit about charting and about technical analysis, which would have helped you realize that it's probably going to drop more. So, you know, it, 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 I think this idea, one of the things that really bugs me, people say you can't time the market. I just think it's nonsense. Absolute nonsense. I time the market all the time. And when you look at my record of doing it, I'm not that bad at it. You know what I mean? I'm okay at it. And I think this, this sort of, idea that you can't time i just think it's just for the birds mate it's for people who can't be bothered to learn technical analysis basically it's it's it's, it's difficult pete time in the market is difficult and this is why people say it's time in the market rather than time in the market. i i try i try my level best to try and get the, the best price i possibly can regarding watching the markets and all the rest of it don't always do it can't time the top can't time the bottom it's just the nature of the game you try and do the best that you possibly can but the best winners in the markets are the ones that are holding stocks for three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, of which there are few and far between in the in the in the stock market now. There's very few on Twitter that have got anything in their portfolio beyond three three years, you know. So you know the people that are talking up these stocks, you, you should go back to them and say, actually, how long have you held this stock then? Right. You know, and most people will say two years, three years I've held, held that stock. But the vast majority of them haven't. And I think the important thing to say here is that the people that are championing certain stocks, you should say to them, OK, you've added some more to this stock again. You've added again and added again. What is now your average buying price for that stock? Because given the fact that the share price is down 30, 40 percent, near as damn it, it would say that quite a few of them are getting near to break where their break even is on that particular stock, excluding dividends or with dividends. So be very mindful of doing your own research and not just following people that are talking about stocks. And we keep saying well, this. We, you know. It's the classic thing. People don't give you visibility. They say they bought this stock. They say they're in for the long term, blah, blah, blah. They don't tell you what price they bought. They don't tell you when they bought it. And, and they don't, they, you know, they don't tell you their subsequent trades they do. So for all you know, they could be selling when they're telling you to buy. And that's probably what a lot of them are doing. So be really careful on that. If people don't give you visibility, if you can't trust someone, then you shouldn't be even remotely considering following any of the ideas they have. Um, something I wanted to come back on there, it linked to what we were saying earlier. If I was to say to you, Pete, right, out of two things, right, what you've got to make a choice out of two things, one or the other, right? You can't have them both. What do you think is the most important? The stock you buy or the time you buy it? Definitely the stock you buy. I totally agree. But I bet you there'll be loads of people who say the time you buy it. For me, Pete, I'm ordinarily, I would say, 85% of my holdings, the stocks that I hold, I'm looking to hold for a minimum of three years. Absolutely. Right? And, and I'm looking at it in a sense of I've, I've done the, I've taken a long time over choosing these stocks and I'm still making mistakes. Right. So once I've bought them, I carry on then researching to maintain my knowledge of what's going on regarding the stock. And that's important. So I'm buying the stock and I'm looking at 
the company, I'm looking at the management, I'm looking at what they've said strategically they're going to do for a very, very long time. Now, if the management turn out to be, you know, not so good, I'm being polite now, um, <laughs> and that th they don't execute, then obviously that changes the context of what I bought the, the stock for. And those are the times when I go, you know what, I've lost patience with this. And whether that's within three months, I've all of a sudden, the time that I buy it is the time that the, mar the, the <laughs> profit margins come yeah. or, the com or the CEO walks out the door or there's a fraud thing kicking off. I'm going, oh, my days. It's just my luck that I've timed this completely wrong. Yeah. Um, so that yeah. changes the whole context, Pete. But if yeah. I bought a stock and I'm buying it for recovery and we haven't got all this hubba -bubba 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 going on with the guy in the markets, I'm looking at buying in 2022 and seeing what happens with this in 23, 24, 25, da -da 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 -da. and I'm looking at all the flux regarding the markets and all the rest of it, and I'm looking to continue holding it. But bear with me, bear with me. The caveat is this. The company still has to be executing. The company hasn't got to do something rash, yeah? Everything that we know about the market tells us that we are heading into uncertainty the minute that we hit the buy button. The, the law of investing is one of uncertainty. Oh, yeah. I don't care what anyone on, on Twitter says about my stock. In fact, I revel in the fact that they're going to say something negative and bearish about it because hopefully they find some noise or some stuff that's bad about the company, which I didn't know. So bring it. I'm not bothered. If, it, if you find something about a stock that I own and it's really, really bad, I'm going to prick my ears up and go, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, I didn't know that. Thank you very much. I'm out of here. I'm done. Yeah. I'm selling. But other than that, you should relish other people actually bringing something to the table, which makes you question the stock. Not don't really. block them. Don't mute them. Don't get angry just because they're not bullish enough about your stock. Actually embrace it because you might learn something, you know, because the people who are sitting there stubbornly going, no, that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. The share price is moving from its 52 week high to where it is now. For a reason, it's not that one or two people that have said, actually, I'm not keen on your stock. It's because the market is telling you something else. There might be institutions selling that you don't even know about until they get to that particular threshold further down. So just be mindful that the 52-week high was there. Where is your stock now? Have a look at where it was in on February the 1st, 2020, before the markets capitulated to March. Have a look at that share price on February the 1st. Have a look at the recent 52-week high and have a look at where the share price is now. And if your stock is heading back towards the February 2020 price, there's something not quite right in town regarding that particular stock. Because it should be way above that. And if it's below the February the 1st, 2020 price, watch out. Because you're looking at a two-year low. Yeah? Two-year low. Why is your stock at two-year low with only just having noise about Ukraine and Russia? Think about it, folks. Sometimes we are wrong. And you have to admit it and not be so stubborn. I've been stubborn on certain stocks because I'm thinking, oh, crikey, I'm looking at that far out. Sometimes you've got to go and just take the hit and go, move on. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. On that, on that, is it the stock that's important all the time you buy it? It also comes down to whether you're an investor or whether you're a trader. If you're a long-term investor, it's totally the stock you buy that is the most important thing. Whether you've got it, you know, if you, if you buy a stock at one point in time and Five years later, that stock has gone up, you know, 300 percent. It doesn't matter whether you got in at the absolute low or whether you got in 20 percent higher. But you've done really well on it. The timing really wasn't that crucial. But if you're a trader, it's totally different. I mean, the thing is with traders, you can buy any old garbage, right? It doesn't matter what it is. It could be the worst stock on the planet. You can buy it if you buy it at the right time and you sell it at the right time, which might be buying it at nine o'clock in the morning and selling at 18 minutes past nine, that might be the right thing. But as a trader, it's a different game. And people need to, I think it's the classic problem. And it's it's one of the problems that you find with Twitter and that is that a lot of people have arguments on Twitter and whatever, because they're different. They're one person arguing as an investor, the other person arguing as a trader. And, and that conflict you you know you're always going to get that argument because they're they're playing a different game. It's 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 illogical almost for the two to be having a discussion. So you know it's 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 yeah it's something to bear in mind. Absolutely right, Pete. Let, let's let's move on. Um, we'll come back to some stocks in a little while. We're gonna we've got a few stocks to share with you, ladies and gents. Hopefully we'll give you some research ideas a bit later.
oh, to run uh, regarding stuff to consider and to look at um, for the long term. Pete, let's talk about your uh, your charity. Why don't you talk about the the, yeah. the, the backup trust um, um, yeah. at the moment? So we started last last podcast. People have already generated some money towards it. So tell us a bit more about it, and then um, tell yeah. us who's been kind enough to donate so far. Well, um, the the charity that we're supporting, you know, the Twin Peaks podcast, if you like, and 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 our fantastic listeners are supporting this year is the Backup Trust, which is is a charity that's involved in spinal injuries. And um, you can read all about it on their website and whatever, you know, no problem. But but um, what I wanted to mention was that um, it's been a real change in how spinal injuries are treated. So just just so that people know, it's like a spinal injury is where you break your back. So you know your backbones, yeah, your vertebrae. Effectively, you smash those vertebrae, they break whatever. Um, now, some people are incredibly lucky, right? There are people who break those bones. In fact, it's, quite, it's actually quite common that people break those bones and it doesn't do any damage to the spinal cord, which runs through those vertebrae, yeah? Um, those are, I mean, they're incredibly lucky people, but actually they're a lot more common than you think. So when, when you hear someone's broken their back, don't immediately think, oh, my God, they're paralyzed because they may not be. But anyway, if you're unfortunate like me, what happens is you break the um, vertebrae. And in the pro what happened with me, you can see it on the screen, hopefully, if you're watching on YouTube, because now we have this amazing video thing. Um, it it's all very modern here, you know. Um, so imagine those are two different vertebrae. What happened with me was I sort of it sort of got crunched and whatever in, in the motorbike accident. And it. And it did that and sort of completely smashed the spinal cord, which runs through the middle. Yeah. So it's look, at it, it's, it's like it's like all your wiring and stuff going into your house. Yeah. The sort of main pipe into your house of wiring. It's like someone's just chopped it off. So you still got all the little wires, like all the nerves and things. And, you know, they're still in place. But the main connection, if you like, has been chopped. Anyway, point was right. When I was injured back in 1998, um, the way I was treated because I had sort of like fractures and it was more the, it was more this action that had knackered the, um, spinal cord. Um, what they did was I had to go on a thing called bed rest. But basically you lie on a bed for eight weeks in my case, I think it might've been benign in the end, where you're just lying down flat and the nurses are doing everything for you and whatever. It's brilliant. Um, and, and the bones heal, and, and that's what happens, you know? And then you get up in a wheelchair. The incredible thing is, you can only sit in a wheelchair for like like half an hour. If, well, probably not even that. Probably, probably the first time that they get you out of bed and into a wheelchair. I mean, bear in mind, you've been vertical. So, sorry, horizontal, not vertical. Horizontal for, um, you know, eight, nine weeks. They get you to sit up in a wheelchair you can't even last 10 minutes. You, basically, the blood doesn't get to your, to your head, to your brain, and you just pass out. And that's exactly what happened to me. It was, it was classic. And, uh, and it takes you then quite a long time to get to a situation where you can sit properly in your wheelchair. And, and you know, I remember thinking to myself, God, am I ever going to be able to sit in my wheelchair all day? I can't even last an hour. You know, and it was absolutely exhausting. It's amazing how lying down for eight weeks just takes all your strength away. Uh, and obviously then, you know, you, you, you're adapting to life in a wheelchair and whatever. Anyway, so the point is um, that the approach to treating spinal injury has now changed. And instead of having those eight or nine weeks where really you get the opportunity to think about what's happened to you, you've got other people in beds alongside you who are also spinally injured, you know, and they're in the same sort of process. I was lucky because I had a load of guys my own age and we had a right old laugh. So that was good. Um, but um, so, so you've got time to sort of think about what's happening. You see you see um, patients who are in hospital in Stoke Mandeville Hospital before and you see what you know, you see them doing it. You think, well, if they can spend their life in a wheelchair, I can do it. You know what I mean? I, I'm as good as they are. You know, I can do it. So but what has happened now is that the whole approach has changed. And they, the way that the care is viewed now, it's about you have your accident and literally they operate on you straight away. 
So you're into surgery and you're having the bones fixed with like, you know, metal pins or whatever you're having done. Yeah. And what happens is instead of having like eight weeks of bed rest, they've got you up in a wheelchair in a week or something, which like to me is just like incredible. Um, now, obviously, that has the advantage that it frees up a bed. <laughs> no, <laughs> as the advantage that you sort of don't lose your strength in the same way that I did. But I think what happens is the psychological side is not so good. You don't have that time that I was saying about to sort of think about what's happened to you. It's like it's like one minute you're walking, next minute you have an accident, next minute you have an operation, next minute you're in a wheelchair. It's so fast. There's no time for this sort of mental adjustment. And I think this is where um, a charity like Backup comes in. Because what backup does is so much about the psychological side and about helping people adapt to having a spinal injury. And they do a lot of work with kids and stuff and, and, and all that kind of thing. So, but I think, you know, that it's like giving people back confidence and, and, and helping people to, to live their lives in wheelchairs. And I think that's like a really important thing to do. So, you know, it's, it's, it's brilliant work backup does. Anyway, I thought you'd be interested. I went on bloody ages there, didn't I? But anyway. No, um, worries, mate. no it's, good, it's good to explain the work that they do. Um, but I think the, the important thing, Pete, for me, is yeah. the, ad, the advert that we put out the other week as well about the work they do with, with, uh, with the children as well. Absolutely. It's really important. You know, because yeah. I think we, we, you know, you touched on it when we were conversing, you know. It happened to you when you're in, you know, the age that you were. But for 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 an accident to happen to a child, that's that yeah. absolutely devastating, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I was, so, so, I was I was 33, and I, I I sort of took the view that's quite a quite a good age because it's like you're old enough to have lived a bit of life, but you're young enough still to adapt. Whereas there were people in hospital. There was a girl. I remember a girl, right? And this, this is one of the things. It's not just accidents, you know. A lot of people get illnesses, and I think there's a thing. I, I might have this wrong. I think it's a thing called transverse myelitis, which is incredibly common, which sort of just basically there was a girl. Right. And I'm sure she was about 14. And literally she woke up one day, couldn't pay. Something's not right here. Next minute she's paralyzed in the wheelchair, pretty much the same as me. And you think, how did that happen? She literally woke up one day and she's 14. And like how hard that must be. I just can't imagine. So anyway, Absolutely. that's brilliant. Absolutely. Um, we've had um, so well. We only talk yeah, share, share with us what's happened with the with the charity so far, yeah. Pete, please. Yeah, we only talked about the um, charity in the last podcast two weeks ago, and the response has been absolutely fantastic. I'll, I'll, I'll whiz through some names of people who've given. We've had Steve Oldsworth, oh, you know, Steve, Elric, that's lemon inve lemon investor, top man. Zig, my mate Zig, know him. Um, Camper van, I'm not sure who Camper van investor is, but thank you very much. Someone called Anonymous has given a contribution. Fantastic. We mate, we're quite happy to get millions of them from Anonymous. Anonymous. Anonymous could, could end up giving loads. Um, right, I have to press a button here. Right, okay. Then Terry, we know good old Terry, yeah. Good, good chap. Um B Bus, that's Battle Bus, top man, really good chap, Battle Bus. And uh, Elizabeth, that's Lizzie, we know her well, good girl. Um, the secret accountant, another top guy, well worth following on Twitter. And um, Jim Walsh. Yeah, we know Jim, don't we? And uh, oh, I think we got more. So, oh, I'll, I'll run through quick. So, Di Edwards, Pete Higgins, and some idiot called Wheelie Dealer. Who's that? He total, total Muppet, that guy. So, um, yeah, no, great response, guys. Thank you so much for what you're doing. We're off to brilliant start. 697 quid given already. Anything you can give, whatever. Just, you know, these podcasts are free. You, you, you probably get a lot of help and advice and guidance and, and well don't give advice um you get a lot of lot of suggestions and whatever and you know if you want to just say yeah thanks guys then just you know bung a fiver in for the charity that's all you got to do the um the link should be on the bottom of this you know if you're watching on youtube the link should be on the bottom um if not you got it there pete to read out or no i, I should be able to find it hang on um it is i'm struggling to find it now um oh here we are it's on my website so it's it's uh www.justgiving.com slash fundraising slash twin peaks 
just pretty straightforward and easy. So there you go. Cool, cool. I just want to say thanks to everyone that's donated so far. And if you've enjoyed any of the, any of the previous podcasts or if you've enjoyed this one, then please, please, please do um, support Pete and us regarding this particular charity. I wanted to, to start, Pete, if I may, uh, with a stock um, which I had in mind um, before you mentioned beds and laying in bed. And oh. it was actually a, a, a stock that I've lampooned and lots of other people have lampooned. And it's it was one of those IPOs that everyone you know has been wanting to forget about uh, when it came out. I think everyone was like, really? A, a bed company? Another bed company floating and IPOing? Hey, hey. Um, and, and talking about Eve Sleep, Pete. Do you remember yeah. that one? I saw it this morning. Yeah. Um, I, I saw the yeah, RNS. Yeah. It's yeah, going to yeah. deal with the... Uh, Partnership with DFS. Yep, just about to tell you about it, Peter Piper. Far so, away. It, Far away. So its share, it shares are currently up or close, should I say, um, 60% um, today. Um, so a deal with DFS. Uh, initially, the agreement will cover dfs.co.uk website, but there are plans to extend the partnership to DFS showroom estate later in the year. DFS will stock a range of Eve mattresses, including Eve's original and premium hybrid models, as well as a range of Eve bed frames. Plans are in place to extend the ranges at a later date. So that to me is probably the, the, the not the first, but a significant deal for Eve. Um, share price is at 2.85 pence, up 60% today. Now, bearing in mind regarding this particular stock, it's been around for a little while. Uh, been as high um, going back to 2018, December 2017, one pound 30 pence. And its 52 week low is 1.6 pence. It's one that I know that lots of other people um, around various different chat rooms have been talking about and promoting. I'll be polite now, uh, ah. promoting for some time. And the stock has absolutely gone nowhere and lots of people have lost their absolute shirts on it it's it's not a stock that I'm, I'm recommending here at this point it's just something i thought you know what that's quite a it says a lot that dfs has gone in um use the term loosely into bed with eve um but well, it, could be the, it, could, it could be could be the start of something folks market caps only 4.8 million i don't really tend to look at stocks right down at this sort of small end of the scale i know a lot of you guys, ladies, like your small caps. They're very, very volatile. It's one of them. Today, it's up 60%. Next month, it could right. come out with some news, and it's down 60%. I've it's got just, it here. You know what I mean? Not for widows and orphans, mate. I'm looking on SharePad, and it's um, it, it's saying on SharePad, 7.7 .7 market cap. We're, we're talking tiny. The only thing that's really interesting is it actually says net borrowing as a minus figure which is 8.2 million. So that basically says that the last set of accounts that this is based on, it had 8.2 million of cash. So, I mean, we're talking here about a very illiquid share. We're talking about a partnership and quite often partnerships lead to nothing. But I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I saw it today. I thought, wow, that's the first bit of news I've seen out of Eve for a long time where I thought, that's actually potentially a positive development because up until that, it's just been one way traffic, been dreadful, hasn't it? I noticed it's got a, got a new female CEO. And we had this discussion on, on podcast TPA, TPI 68 about how more women were leading companies and, and how personally I feel that women seem to lead them better often. So I, I, I wouldn't I'm, buy it. I'm, ho I'm hoping. I think it's incredibly. Well, I'm, I'm, it's not, it's... Yeah, no. But the point is, it's now something on my radar, whereas before I wouldn't even have bothered wasting my time with it. Now it's actually on my radar again. And it's an interesting situation. It's certainly not something I'd buy today, but I would keep an eye on it over coming months. I'll read what news they put out, read what RNSs they put out, whatever. Maybe at some point in time, it could be an interesting investment again. But as, as we yeah, say yeah. at the moment, it's very risky. Whether you are an experienced or new investor, you know how valuable it is to conduct portfolio enhancing analysis and to have easy access to data that will give you the edge. 
As a Twin Peaks Investing Podcast listener, you can access an exceptional offer via SharePad from ShareScope, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. This special Twin Peaks offer is available to new subscribers only, and you can subscribe using the promo code Twin Peaks. The incredible and exclusive offer means that monthly subscribers will get their second month free and annual subscribers will get their 13th month free. Sign up and subscribe to SharePad today using the Twin Peaks promo code and you can save up to £69. Visit sharescope.co.uk forward slash sharepad for further details and subscribe to the investing and trading analysis and data you need. Okay, and another another one I wanted to, uh, to, 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 to caught my eye this week, Pete. It's called Benchmark Holdings. Have you heard of them? Ticker B- symbol BMK? BMK, yeah, I know it. It's, 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 yeah. it's so, so oh. Benchmark is a leading aquaculture biotechnology company. Um, its, its mission is to enable aquaculture producers to improve their sustainability and profitability. Benchmark brings together biology and technology to develop innovative products and solutions to improve yield, quality, and animal health and welfare for its customers. And it came, it came out with what I thought was reasonable results today, uh, but actually the shares fell. And I thought, well, let me just watch and see what happens with the markets today regarding it. And essentially, they, they had excellent Q1 results with strong growth and revenues and adjusted, adjusted EBITDA. And the headline was building momentum to walk following strong full year results performance group revenues 38 percent ahead for the year with good growth in all three businesses um advanced nutrition revenues was up to 26 percent genetics was up 20 percent health revenues was up 347 percent above q1 f f uh, for year 21 um, so it's one of those smaller smaller companies um operating loss was halved net debt was reduced from 80.9 million to 64.3 and what interested me this morning when I was reading it is that they've got cash of 50.6 million uh, pounds. Um, so that was quite an interesting sort of um, level of cash. Let me just find out here what the market cap is so we can com- put that towards um, the cash levels. Just bear with me one second. Um, so the, the market cap is 383 versus 50 million market cap, 50 million cash. So that's another interesting one. Um, sitting at 52-week lows, it's a range of um, what we got 50, 50, 50.15, 50.75 pet peak finished today, down 5%. It touched the, the 52-week low of 50, 50 and a half pence, and the 52-week high is 68 pence. So an interesting one. Another one that I thought actually that doesn't read too badly, and maybe p- the market was expecting more, or investors were expecting more. I don't know. It's the classic problem, I think. Benchmark, I mean, I know it reasonably well, and, and it links to another company, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, they do, like, um, drugs for salmon lice. Yeah, believe it or not, right? Yeah. Salmon, they, you know them fishy things? They get they <laughs> get lice, right? You know, like your dog gets yeah. lice, or, or, or you get lice if you don't wash much, yeah? Um, and <laughs> that's probably right off. But they also do, like, like, like... Um, drugs and treatments for prawns and stuff so anyway but they've they've had such a sort of really patchy history and i i read it quite i read about them quite often i find it quite a frustrating company because on the face of it aqua aquaculture so it's like agriculture but it's aqua because of the fishy link yeah the prawns and whatever um that stuff in theory, with with growing populations and with inflation and whatever, it should be a really interesting place to be. You know, food is is often a, a, a nice place. But I just think, you know, you're talking about the debt there. I mean, the debt looks really quite meaty. No, they've got cash. They've got cash, Pete. Well, they, the trouble is they've got cash, but they've also got this massive amount of debt. And I just, because, you know, net, net debt, excluding leases, is 43 million. That's quite a lot of debt. When you're not actually making money, you're, you, you, they lost money of like four point. Well, I said non-cash, so adjusted EBITDA. Adjusted EBITDA is often, or certainly EBITDA, 
is like a proxy for cash. Yeah. So it's like if you were being generous, you could say they're generating seven million of cash. Um you'd have to look into it to be certain. But even that, you know, it's seven million of cash would still be of, of cash profit would still be pretty low to a 43 million debt and with a history of not really succeeding. I don't know, mate. I mean, it's, it's certainly well, it's, what, it's not a recommendation. It's just, it's just, it's just caught yeah. my eye, Pete. Net, net, net debt was exactly. reduced to 64.3. They're saying they've got cash of 50, 50.6. So they, you know, you, you, you square that at 14 million and say they've got 40 millions of debt. You know, it's, it's an interesting uh, company and it's one I've looked at a lot. And as I said, I've actually been frustrated by it. There's another company that a mate of mine talks about, and a guy called Anshuman, yeah, he's, he's on Twitter. A good, he's a good lad. He, um, he, he talks about um, Genus, and I think that's an interesting stock as well. And it's a similar thing because instead of being fishy, this is agriculture and they're more to do... <laughs> We've talked about in the podcast, I'm sure they do. I don't want to say it, but they do bull, bull semen, right? Semen. I, yeah, I nearly used another word and I really shouldn't. So yeah, Pete, do, you're just the person, you're just the right person to speak about that particular topic. Go for it. It's a nightmare, isn't it, mate? I don't want to, honest, no, I'm not going to go there. No, I dread to think where this is going to go. go so so they, they talk about, you know, what comes out of the male bull, right? So that stuff, yeah. They they basically they they um they they have like a sperm bank yeah of like all the best bulls so like in America now where they have like an amazing prize winning pedigree amazing bull they'll they'll have the semen for it and then obviously they inseminate millions of cows with this stuff and and obviously farmers pay to use this you know to have this insemination and they do stuff with pigs and whatever as well so. Anyway, really interesting company. Do you know what is actually quite particularly interesting is I'm looking at a share price, uh, looking at a share price chart, and it peaked out at sort of over 60, 60 quid, 6000p, um, did a fantastic example of a, of a Batman ears on the chart. You know, when it goes up and it, it goes up and then it comes back a bit, it goes up and it comes to the same level and then drops down. Brilliant Batman ears. Anyway. Since that is tanked to like 31.62, so it's half the price it was not very long ago, but it's still in that downtrend. I'm just looking at um, SharePad now to see how the valuation stacks up. Genus is a company, GNS, that has always attracted a very high valuation. And I think because of its monopoly kind of position because it you know it owns all these bulls and no one else can get that it's fantastic ip i think it's sort of justified that it should be on a high rating but obviously it shouldn't be on a ridiculously high rating so having a look at it now as it stands today it's on a forecast pe of 34.6 falling two years out of 29.8 you're getting 1.1% dividend and then two years out 1.2%. Now, a forward PE of 34.6 is high. It is high. I think maybe it could be a bit lower, but it's for Genus, it's starting to get in the realms of being realistic. So it might be that it doesn't fall much more. You know, maybe we're getting to the to the the end of the drops, if you like. It, you know, I think it's an excellent start. It's like it's like when you talk about buying quality, GNS is quality. And it's really a case of getting it at the right price. But it's the kind of stock that you could buy it. And I reckon in five years, it would do really well, even if it was bought today. You know? Well, you wouldn't be able to buy it today. The market shut. But um, yeah. The thing so that I've always noticed with, with Genesis, though, Pete, is that a lot, when I've looked at it and the, the headlines have either been, oh, things are really good regarding port prices in China or things are really bad regarding port prices in China. It seems like to be hinged on that. It's like, is that is that their biggest market? I've never really looked at them a bit no, long think, enough to, to know. I think I think the bull thing is probably bigger and, and probably more important. They've also got prawns as well, I believe now. Um, yeah. But no, you're right. There's, there's been a real problem that China devours immense amount of pigs. And they've had this big problem. Cool. Cool. With flu, yeah. And it was killing all the herds and whatever. And it was just... It just became an absolute nightmare for, for Jenners. But obviously, because they had the bull bit and the prawns, it, it sort of helped. 
Um, I don't hold it. Like I say, I, I think my mate might hold it. I'm not sure. But it's it, it's definitely an interesting stock. And I actually have held it in the past. I probably held it before I was doing Wheelie Dealer, probably about 10 years ago. And I made a good little bit of money on it. But back then, I was a complete idiot. And I used to just buy things and sell them. And I'd, I'd make a few quid and think I did well. And actually, I was just being a bit of a fool, really. I'd been better off just holding on to it. Because it is, it is quality. You got any others you want to talk about there, mate? I, I want to talk about some uh, probably another one um, after this, Pete. I'm going to say this one very, very briefly. Yeah. Um, you, you and I both own GSK and have come up with a name. And thankfully, it's not a, a completely stupid name. and It hasn't got any random capital letters all over it. And the, the consumer unit, consumer healthcare division, is going to be renamed, I'm pronouncing it, Helion. I'm not sure how you pronounce it, Pete. It's H-A-L-E-O-N. Mate, I've no idea. How I mean, are you pronouncing it? Elon? I think it said in the actual thing how you should pronounce it. I think it was Halion or something. What did you say? Right. Okay. So so that's what's coming down the pipe for GSK holders, hopefully in the second half of the year. Um, we're going to get the split off. It's going to be size and, and big enough to go into – the FTSE top 20, I think, uh, regarding the valuation. Obviously, we've already rejected um, Unilever's bid of 50 billion. Um, so that puts us right up there regarding the top top 20 um, companies in the FTSE, um, FTSE 100. So we're going to end up with probably two um, listings regarding GSK and then Halion um, went, wants that list, Pete. So we'll see what true value we actually get, mate, regarding um, this IPO that potentially is coming down the pipe unless you know, uh, a white knight comes out and offers 55 or 60 billion for the unit. Well, I'm looking looking now on um, my phone at, at the chart for Glaxo, and it is in a really nice one-year uptrend. And at the moment, I, I actually think that uptrend is likely to continue. You know, if you think about it, Glaxo has got that sort of defensive air about it. So even though we're having all the problems in, in, in Ukraine and whatever, and uh, you know the tone of the market is so bad. Glaxo is another one of those stocks that is bucking the trend really and, and sort of holding up very well. So, you know, that's I, I'm very happy holding Glaxo. Yeah, mate, I've got one. Go for I'll, it. Go for it. Yeah, I'll just it, again, it's just a quickie. This one, a company that IPO'd quite recently. I'm not saying that anyone should buy it, but I'm just making people aware of it, right? Because I think it might be something interesting. And this is a company that's called Windward, right? Like like, like the Windward Islands, right? I, I don't know why it's... Anyway, um, there is a shipping connection. This is the point. So it's WNWD. Now, I'm obviously biased because it's got WD, Wheelie Dealer, in it. So, you know, that, that's obviously why I'm attracted to it. Um, so WNWD, what they do is like AI, data analytics, information, whatever, about shipping movements, like where, where ships are going, cargoes and whatever. And they had an announcement yesterday or the day before, whenever it well, might even have been last week, that was something about they've um, launched a new uh, – let me just remind myself what it, what it was they were doing – but it's basically like a new information, like a new module on the software they do. Obviously, we all love software businesses. A new module that, um, here we are, Ocean, it, it's an AI-powered ocean freight visibility solution. So basically, if, if you're a company that does a lot of moving cargoes and stuff, you can see where boats are around the world and, and what costs are and all sorts of stuff. Anyway, it's all clever stuff. I think it looks quite an interesting business. The fact it's got IP, it's a software company, that's, that's often good news. The chart is absolutely bloody dreadful. It's horrible. So it's falling. So don't go near it, right? Don't, don't even think about it. But I just think it's an interesting company and maybe maybe there is something there, you know? Have you come across it, mate? I haven't as yet, mate. Like you say, it's only freshly freshly minted, isn't it? So I've not really looked at that one at all uh, as yet. So I, I will um, give it a, a look-see, though, um, going forward, Pete. Um, I wanted to quickly mention, I mean, so we, we do get a lot of people giving us um, a heads up when we, we get something right. And um, I got a, a DM 
um, from a, a, a chap called Dave the other day. And he says, oh, you guys spoke about this a while ago, didn't you? And I went, did we? <laughs> so I had to go back and I had to go back and check, Pete. Um, and it was um, the, the Clipper takeover. And um, Clipper, Clipper Logistics got a bid, Pete. We'd actually spoken about it going back in September of 2020. And at the time I mentioned it, the share price was £4.40. And oh, the share okay. price or the bid value at the minute um, for, for Clipper Logistics is £9.20. So that's a premium versus the price that we gave in September. Uh, sorry, th 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 at the time we spoke about it, September 2020, 109% uh, premium to that particular price. So that just shows the beauty of what we do here. What we're trying to do is just have a little bit of a chat, have a bit of banter and give some ideas um, for people to go away and research. And sometimes, you know, some people get lucky on, on them. And equally, with regards to what we've said in the past regarding Games Workshop, some people will save money as well um, regarding um, their investments. So that's what we do. That's what we try and do anyway. Um, so, yeah, so that was quite interesting. I'm, I'm sure that particular stock surprised people uh, regarding that particular takeover as well, because it's one of them that a lot of people have talked about. Some people were in the stock, some people weren't in the stock. But it shows the value of what's out there at the minute. Um, there's another oh. one um, that I – sorry, Pete, go on. Oh, mate, you you do your stock, and I've got another one that I must mention today. I don't hold it, um, but I think you might. I think you might, but I'll tell you what. I you, think you, you do it first. You do the one that you want to okay. do first because I've, I've got an I, idea that I want, to, I want to hear what you've got to say regarding whatever it is you think I've got. Go on. I bet it's the stock you hold, and I bet it's the one you were going to talk about now which would be really funny if it is. Right, the stock I want to mention had results today. It is RWS. Now, this is a company that does intellectual property and stuff like that, and like, like patent stuff and whatever. And they recently bought SDL, the language translation company, which was a really, we talked about this on the podcast a lot. We talked about SDL, and I think we've mentioned RWS. And the interesting thing with this is it's one of those stocks that's always been on a very high rating. You know, it's been on a forward PE of 26, 27, whatever. It's a highly rated. It is a quality company. And they come out of results today. They're in line with expectations or whatever. But what really struck me about it was that it's come off like everything has. Um, and I thought, actually, the valuation argument is starting to look reasonably attractive. So you're talking about a forecast P.E. of 16.8. And then two years out, that drops to 15.2. I mean, I'm sorry, that is actually getting quite attractive. You're getting 2.6 percent dividend rising two years out to 2.9. I think it's got a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of debt. Um, very interesting company. Lot to like. Um, one, one again to look at. I mean, I'm not saying it's a buy today. It could go a lot lower, and it probably will, because you know how these things are. But I just think it's a, a, a great – we were talking earlier about it's the quality of what you buy, not when you buy it, that matters. And this is the kind of company that really is quality, but the chart's dreadful on it, and it's dropped loads, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't go near it at the moment. But there you go. Ah. Yeah, it, it, it is in fact one I hold, Pete. It's one I've declared some time ago. Uh, I bought it back in September, September 2019. I have tweeted about it in the past, um, and I still hold it. So I bought it originally as SDL, and obviously it consumed, merged with, took over um, SDL, hence the reason why I've got um, th those particular shares. Uh, yes, the results were good. Um, yes, they've been sold off. It's the sort of company, Pete, where... I, I don't see any problems with continuing to hold it. I'm disappointed at the the extent of the of the sell off, but it's the nature of the game. Sometimes you just got to sometimes grin just gr gr grin and bear it. If you use the technicals, I would have been out of it at six quid, six, five pounds fifty. It's sitting at fifty two week lows at the minute um, for all intents and purposes, um, there or thereabouts. And am I disappointed with it having held it for for eighteen months, nearly two nearly two two years in September? Sorry two years already um, and going on to two and a half years, I am disappointed with it. Um, should it be down at these levels? Probably not. But the markets will do what they will do. And sometimes you've got to go, you know what? Fine, fair enough. I'm waiting. The it's not one I've, I've, I've sold uh, in my portfolio. Otherwise, I would have put a contract note out and, and put the stuff on there. So it's one of those where I'm thinking, okay, 
let me just watch and see what's going on with the market. Yeah. Watch and see what's going on for the next couple of weeks, couple of months and see what's going on uh, regarding the markets. And then I'll decide what to do with it. Um, I thought the results okay were today were okay. Yeah. There, there weren't anything that actually went. I was like, wow. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, the, the, the markets, the markets are very, very, can be unfair sometimes. And, and maybe I'm biased, but it's a solid company. The results have never really disappointed to the to the point where you've gone, uh oh, that's a profit warning. That's going to get smashed. It's just trickled, trickled, trickled down. And sometimes what I think happens, Pete, and this happens with lots of stocks that get merged with, is the lock-in period for some of these stocks regarding the, the two entities get together and yeah. the, the large shareholders or the institutions that are, are in the stock can either get out whenever they want to get out or there's lock-in periods for certain pe people, whether that be three months, six months or a year. And I think that causes or causes a little bit of if the white word is attrition, where the stocks just get sold off because people are exiting. They don't want to be, they don't want to be holding our, our WS stock. So that happens sometimes as well. Yeah, no, I think that's a fair point. But it's, I think it's, it's, you know, it's, if, if, if I was holding our WS now and it was falling like that, I wouldn't get overly concerned, especially because I've got a load of hedges on, so which, which is offsetting some of the drop more on a sort of portfolio basis. Um, but what I would probably be thinking is, I really like RWS. When I get buying again, that's one of the stocks I might be buying more of because I really think it's a really, really good business. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to briefly talk about this particular stock. I don't own it. The ticker symbol is dollar sign T-E-N. And it jumped, Pete, today um, almost, well, might as well say 100%. <laughs> it just got taken over by a firm called Apollo Funds. Wow. Um, and it's essentially it is a um, auto part supplier, U.S. auto part supplier. And it's got taken over. It was at 10 pounds per share or there or thereabouts. It's got taken over for tw sorry, ten dollars a share. And it's got taken over for um, for twenty dollars a share today. Uh, One point six billion pound deal. And this and the reason why I mentioned it is because there's lots of conversation about everything in the U.S. is overvalued. Um but I think, you know, if we move away from what people think regarding um, tech stocks, there's lots of other stocks in, available in the U.S., folks. For those that don't know, I'm, I'm joking. Um, there's lots of different sectors. And obviously, that's almost like an engineering manufacturing sort of stock. But 100 percent premium I've not seen for a long time anywhere. And that's what happened today regarding that particular takeout. So takeovers are still going on. And yeah. it's mindful, I think, for people to actually start uh, looking um into the, the the London Stock Exchange across AIM, across FTSE, at the smaller slash medium sub um, FTSE 250 sort of level at what's out there. We are, and I've keep, been saying this for the past year, despite the volatility of the markets and what's going on, we are still going to see takeovers, folks. Yeah? And be mindful of the people that jump out the next day and say, I've got this particular stock, I bought it last week. Um, when they never mentioned it before takeovers are coming um, and just be mindful of the stocks that you've got in your portfolio if you can work out and ascertain what the true value is or what you think is the value then you're probably going to do okay with some of the stocks that you're holding um, just keep an eye out on the ones that simply are not worth holding in your portfolio and build up a, a store of cash to buy the stocks that are truly truly under, undervalued and actually could do really really well for you going forward one year six months out, two years out. Well, mate, funnily enough, as that, that is Teneco, isn't it? Teneco in Teneco, sorry, did I not say the full name? Well, funnily sorry. enough, you, you got me to look on my phone and whatever. And I noticed I've got an alert from IG Index, which normally means something's happened on the market. NASDAQ is now down 1.9%. This is this is um, nearly nearly eight o'clock now on the 23rd of Feb. So so that that attempt by the bulls to take it up has just been smashed a bit. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah. As I'm I said at the beginning, we're going to have these days where we're plus and minus one percent, plus and minus one percent. And you, me, late, all of you, ladies and gents, have to get used to this volatility until we get something that says this Ukraine thing has stopped. We're going to have this volatility, folks. And if you haven't got the the, the psychological resistance or resilience for this market, you might need to just sell up step out and get out you know otherwise you're going to have to grin and bear it otherwise
is you're going to have to choose your stocks that you're happy to hold yeah, for the next three months, six months, irrespective of what where they go, up or down, over the next couple of weeks and months. Because that's what you're going to have. You're going to be like, oh, crikey, that's great. We're up 1% and FTSE's happy and we're, we're nearer to 7,600. And then tomorrow, we're back down to 7,400. This is what we're going to have, folks. So please bear with the market. And if I hope you've got the resilience for it. I hope you've got the psychological wherewithal for it. Because this is not about February. This is not about January. This is not about March, April, May. This is about what financial well-being you want to be in in 2024, 20, 2026, 2036, 2046. This is what you're saving for. This is what you're investing for, yeah? And when you look at the long-term charts, whether it's the FTSE, whether it's the NASDAQ, whether it's the Dow, whether it's the Apple chart, whether it's the Amazon chart, whether it's the, 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 the Facebook chart, the Amazon, all those charts will show blips of drops of 5, 10, 15, 20, 20 at some point or other in the history of holding the particular stock. And that's sometimes may happen to your portfolio. You'll have a drawdown or a negative period, whether it be two months or three months or, or, or one year. And if you've only been holding or been involved in the market for two or three years, you've not experienced that for a period of more than two or three or four months. But you might have to experience that during the lifetime of your investing career. Well, the, only, the only thing I would add to that is if you've got a portfolio of stocks and you're happy with the stocks. You've just got to stop looking at it. Just shut your brain off and just, you know, just go with it. But the thing that I must say to people, be so careful about your leverage. If you are leveraged on the long side, you've got long exposure. This is not going to be a very nice time for you. And you can lose a lot of money really fast. So don't be playing with spread bets unless you know what you're doing because they're, they're killers. I completely agree. I mean, I'm, I'm, completely non non leveraged whatsoever um it's the reason why i have the cash available to do what i need to do i think the important point you make there Pete, is the fact that there are lots of people have come into the market that came in with furlough money or money that they that they were freed upon because they weren't, weren't going into words were saving lots of money and we saw what happened with our with our leaves lands down a lot of those punters have now gone you know the, the, the they can't play with the phone at the desk because we're in the back in the office now so oh, the yeah. numbers of people trading and investing and actually subsided and I forget what the percentage figure was, but Argreaves Lansdowne is at, sitting at 52-week low or there or thereabouts. It got smashed, um, you know, X amount of percentage a couple of days back. And that's a quality, quality stock. You know, this is the sort of stock that, you know, the Buffettology Fund, I think, at one stage was, hon was, was honing or whatever. Um, and at some point, it will come good. But you've got Argreaves Lansdowne at near 52-week lows. You've got AJ Bell drifting, drift, drifting down. All those platforms that... You know, consumer-led retailers are, are purchasing stocks via. They're all edging lower and lower and lower. So just well, be mindful that yeah. even quality stocks can get hit. It's not just the aim trash as Pete keeps popping up and trying to you know punch people in the nose about. Quality stocks get hit too. And I keep saying this on 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 the on the on the tweets that people keep putting out every now and then. Just because other someone's stocks goes down 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent, don't go in there. Kick it, kicking them whilst they're low. Please don't do that. Show some kindness because you never know when it's your stock that gets hit. And your stock might be a FTSE 100 or FTSE 250 stock. It could happen to yours. Be any so minute. please show some kindness and some generosity to other people on Twitter. Absolutely. Okay, we've overrun. I don't even know how long we've been on this podcast. So it's apologies again, ages, folks. Dude. We, we've ages. rambled on. This will be the, the record two-hour one that everyone's been asking yeah. for. To all the people that do not want a long podcast, my sincere apologies again. Um, and uh, this will go out as is in one in one chunk. It will be on video again. Um, so you'll see me just praying that you actually listen to it before before it gets to the end. Um, so or, or until it gets to the end, should I say? <laughs> I said that all wrong. Um, so, yeah. Two weeks to, to listen to it. Yeah. It's not difficult. I, Absolutely. And once again, folks, thank you all for your feedback. Thank you all. I must say this because I keep forgetting to say it. Every every time this podcast goes out, I do a write-up on the Conquest 3 website and all the people, all the generic good, bad, and indifferent feedback we get, I add it to the website write-up. So the first tweet that goes out that Pete retweets, it's got a link that goes to the Conquest 3 website. And on there is a write-up regarding the whole of the podcast and it gives the feedback as to who's given us feedback and good, bad, indifferent. Also gives a running total as to um, what the um, the backup trust as it will be this year, what that total is and what we've generated in, in the in charitable donations. So that's on that page as well. 
Um, so please visit that page, have a look at it, um, and, and follow us on Twitter as well, because we're constantly replying to feedback that people give us, um, good, bad, or indifferent. So, so if, you, if you like it, please follow us on, 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 on all the social media. If you like it, please like us on YouTube and subscribe on YouTube and subscribe on all the channels that you're on. Sorry, Pete, go on. That was it, but just, yeah, if, if, if you can subscribe, brilliant. Because obviously it helps our numbers and it, it, it gets us to a wider audience. And obviously I know you want to help us do that. So that's brilliant. Cool, cool. Right, apologies again that it's rambled on again and we'll see what we can do about reducing the time. Thanks everybody for listening. Take care, God bless. Next time Pete and I see you, we, we will be in March, 2022. Hopefully we get through the next few days without things getting too too bad or too serious. And hopefully March 2022 is better than January and February of March 22. Take care. God bless you all. This Twin Peaks Investing Podcast is brought to you in association with SharePad from ShareScoop, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. Visit sharescope.co.uk and discover the advantage.